Eo Tyrannus, its name meaning Eo, Dawn, and Tyrannus, Tyrant, was an early tyrannosauroid, and that's been confirmed by a new paper that looks at all the bones we have of the animal. And that makes sense, first off because of the name, but second off, it was given that name because it was already thought to be a member of the tyrannosauroids. And again, that surely lines up with this new paper that looks at all the bones. And one of the bones that actually first suggested it was related to the tyrannosauroids was shown to be even stranger than previously thought, because it was thought to be a pretty traditional set of tyrannosauroid nasal bones. The nasal bones in tyrannosauroids are fused together, and it's been suggested that this was done in order for the animals to start spreading bite forces and bite pressures throughout the skull more effectively, rather than having a single weak point that might break. Now, Eotyrannus is super useful here, because again, Dawn Tyrant, it's a very early tyrannosauroid, so whatever condition it has on its nasal bones is probably what was happening in most of the other early tyrannosaurs. So if we can figure out what's going on with those, we can try and figure out what the group was doing as a whole in evolutionary terms. And rather than just having straight fused nasals, there were a number of features on it that make it really, really unique. These features include things like a small triangular groove on the sides of part of the nasal bones. Additionally, there's large foramina just above this groove, and foramina are just spaces in the bones which allow for nerves and blood vessels to pass through. That way you can try and provide nourishment to different parts of the face. This, along with a few other features, makes the nasal bones entirely unique, even among tyrannosauroids, because again, they are still fused. So what exactly it was doing is hard to tell, and in fact, one of the authors, Darren Nish, has already said there's already a paper in progress that is going to focus just on the nasal bones, simply because we need to look at those in better detail to try and understand why it had some of these strange features. And this kind of sets up a lot of what these researchers found, that there's some things that are pretty similar to most tyrannosaurs, but then with just a slightly unique twist. For example, along with the nasal bones, parts of the maxilla that were preserved are very similar to other tyrannosaur maxilla bones, the maxilla being part of those bones that make up the upper jaw. However, they also were unique in that they helped to show that Eotyrannus didn't have a particularly long skull, and that's actually kind of unique when you look at some of the other tyrannosaurs that are a little bit more derived in a different group. This is most notable in animals like Allioramus and its close relatives, which for the tyrannosaurs had very long skulls. But even things like Albertosaurus still had pretty long skulls, even in comparison to animals like Eotyrannus. So that's actually pretty unique. We were expecting to see something that would have suggested that they potentially ancestrally had long skulls, rather than animals like Eotyrannus having relatively squat skulls. This all means that Eotyrannus was probably a somewhat strange looking tyrannosauroid, because when we think about tyrannosauroids, we think about animals with pretty large heads and relatively short arms, and Eotyrannus was doing kind of the opposite, having a relatively small head and relatively robust arms. And this same kind of pattern repeats even with other relatively large early branching tyrannosauroids, animals like Eutyrannus, which actually branched off earlier than Eotyrannus, but again, had a big head and small arms. So there's something specific that's happening in the early ancestors of this group that stayed small that helps indicate they really weren't taking that body plan to that extreme at least until they reached much larger sizes. And there's actually more that complicates this to an even greater degree, which I will get to in a bit. But this is actually really useful because Eotyrannus serves as a really good specimen to use for kind of the transition from smaller body sizes into larger body sizes in the Tyrannosauroids. Just outside of Tyrannosauroids, you have a group called the Proceratosauridae, and this includes animals like Delong, and Delong was early considered a Tyrannosauroid, but now that group is outside of Tyrannosauroidea, meaning that they're closely related, but not quite the same thing. However, Delong was only about six feet long, or a little over two, maybe up to three meters if it was a big one. Meanwhile, Eotyrannus was probably pushing at least four or five meters, so quite a bit larger. However, that's still a lot smaller than animals like Tyrannosaurus rex, which could have easily been pushing 12 meters. And this helps to bring up the phylogeny that these authors came up with by testing the different characteristics in Eotyrannus and a lot of other dinosaurs. And what they first found is that the Proceratosauridae are up at the top of this phylogeny, essentially the very earliest branching relatives of the Tyrannosauroids. And I want to really emphasize the Tyrannosauroids, because Eoraptor was a Tyrannosauroid, 
not a Tyrannosaurid. Tyrannosauridae had a few very specialized features that helps to group them all together, including some features in the ankle and foot that essentially just help them run longer distances more consistently. And the Tyrannosaurids fall all the way at the bottom of this phylogeny. Essentially, they're one of the last groups to branch off from this lineage. However, it's important to note that between the Tyrannosaurids and between Eotyrannus, there's another third group there that I haven't mentioned yet, and that's the Megaraptora. The Megaraptorans have been really, really hard to try and place phylogenetically, and that's largely because most of them are pretty partial, and the few that are well-preserved haven't been studied in great detail just yet. And there's been a lot of debate as to where they fit phylogenetically. A lot of researchers have said they're probably Allosauroids, meaning closer to animals like Allosaurus, Carcharodontosaurus, and Giganotosaurus. And then there's other researchers who have suggested, no, they're Solurosaurs. So Solurosaurs include things like the Dromaeosaurs, so raptor-type dinosaurs, as well as Ornithomimids, and important for this study, the Tyrannosaurs. Now there's still gonna be debate about their exact placement, but there have been a few different studies more recently that do suggest that they were Solurosaurs. And this one really backs it up, placing them as Tyrannosauroids, and actually the sister group to the Tyrannosaurids. What this essentially just means is that the Megaraptorans are very closely related to animals like Tyrannosaurus rex, but also very importantly, they had a much different lifestyle, or at least hunting style, based on what we know. And this is largely because the Megaraptorans, rather than having massive heads and small arms like famous animals like Tyrannosaurus rex had, instead had very large arms and relatively small heads. I mean, it was still a large-sized head, but not quite as chunky and as pronouncedly deep as the skulls of animals like Tyrannosaurus rex or even Lythronax were. And the thing is, there were some large-bodied Megaraptorans during the early Cretaceous, with things like Seats, Megaraptor, and Australovenator. With a lot of these animals being present in the early Cretaceous, it really helps to suggest that it wasn't just animals like the Carcharodontosaurs that were really dominating the large predatory niches during the early Cretaceous, and then the Tyrannosaurs replacing them later on. And instead, it seems like the Tyrannosaurids were present in these niches, and then later into the Cretaceous, the Tyrannosaurids became much more dominant, at least in the northern continents. And that's because we do still find some Megaraptorans from the late Cretaceous in South America. And I just want to reiterate real here, just to be entirely clear. Eotyrannus does not belong to the Megaraptorans or to the Tyrannosaurids. Instead, it doesn't really fit into any group other than the Tyrannosauroids, which includes both of those other more specific groups. So it's a really great stepping stone for how the Tyrannosauroids, the early ones at least, began to diversify and become what they did become. And so Eotyrannus has answered a lot of questions, but it still leaves a bit more that we really do want to know about. Because as much as we do know, a lot of the fossils are pretty partial and broken up. In fact, one of them is just listed as the Vomer bone with a question mark because they're not actually sure if it is the Vomer bone. So there still needs to be a lot of research trying to understand what Eotyrannus was doing in the environment. And that's really only going to come from more fossils. And there's been a lot of theropod material coming out of the Weldon group where Eotyrannus was found. And the thing is, a lot of those are also broken up but it doesn't really match many of the fossils that we already have. But with these new descriptions of Eotyrannus, we can say that what we do have doesn't really match most of what we have in collections. And not all of the collections have been checked, so maybe some researchers will find some pieces of bone that are isolated and be able to actually identify it as part of Eotyrannus now. And that way, hopefully, we can try and get a better understanding of what this animal is doing.